All right, and now I am just streaming us over to our mystery fans. Facebook is famous for that 15 second delay and then we will go live and look, looks like that is happening. Welcome mighty mystery fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am thrilled, pun intended, to be hosting writer team and couple in real life, Dr. Judy Melanick and TJ Mitchell, whose brand new book, Aftershock, is out today. TJ, Judy, welcome. Tell us about Aftershock. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> uh, Aftershock is our is our second novel in a forensic detective series. Uh, with the the heroine is Dr. Jesse Tesca, who is a medical examiner, very very loosely based on Dr. Judy Melnick here, who is a forensic pathologist uh, and does autopsies to find out why people die for a living. Very cool. I am fascinated by all of this. And I just want to tell everyone who's watching with us today that Judy and TJ are actually joining us live from New Zealand, where they love live and are currently on vacation, but live there full time as well. So welcome and thank you so much for getting up early and caffeinating to join us. Um, I want to welcome everyone on Facebook. Welcome Dee Dee. Welcome Christy. Welcome Gail. Welcome Thomas. Welcome everybody. If you've been here before, you know how it works. And if you're new, here's how it works. This is your time to talk to our featured authors about all things mystery, thrillers, writing, anything you've been wanting to ask these writers about their books, their writing process. I know I'm curious how they make it work on and off the page. This is your chance. So um, my partner in crime, pun intended, Margaret, Margaret Pinard, who's also an author and a, and a part of the Mighty Blaze team here, is handling things over on Facebook. So just go ahead and type your questions in the comment box and we'll get them right over to Judy and TJ. So Judy and TJ, this is your third book together. Your first book was Working Stiffs. That's a narrative nonfiction about what it's like to do the work that you do, Judy, in a morgue every day. Now you've written your second book in the Tesca series, which is of course a mystery. Um, so tell us, I mean, I have so many questions. Tell us what it's like to, to write and work together. How, how do you do it? Does someone do a first draft? Someone says, no, that sucks. I mean, how, tell us all the things. <laughs> um, for me, the way it started was different for each book. So Working Stiff, because it was based on my actual experiences, I kept a diary while I was doing my training years at the New York City Medical Examiner's Office. And then at the end of those two years, I structured it, reorganized it, and then I had to go to work. So I handed it off to TJ and I said, here, you're the English major, do something with this. <laughs> um, at the time he was a stay-at-home dad. So you wanna uh, pick Well, we, yeah. should, we should also so, point out in case it's not clear, yeah. we are a married, married couple. couple. <laughs> and so we get the question a lot, how do you write right. about murders without committing any? And the answer is we have no overlapping skill set. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Melanick has the stories and the imagination to bring those forward. And I'm a writer. I've always been a writer. I'm one of those writers who loves to be locked in a room wrestling with adjectives all day, which she doesn't really care about. So we I never really we never step on each other's toes. <laughs> and and she she essentially hands me the story. I work on it. I, ha I, hand, I it back. hand it back to her. She reads it out loud to me. We go back and forth. We make changes. She makes corrections to all the science, the science in our books is 100% real and also the police procedure. Yeah. The, and the she dialogue. ends up changing a lot of yeah. the dialogue that I write with <laughs> cops because it turns out that I only know how cops talk from TV shows. Yeah. And she I know works how with actual yeah. cops talk. Yes. And so that's how we work. And then just like we go back and forth in our interview here, you'll see this is how we do our writing. Um, but the three books were somewhat different. Uh, working Stiff Ab as I said was based on a diary. It's a memoir, it's but a memoir, Working Stiff yeah. is written in the first person. It, it, Judy, Judy wrote it as a yeah. diary and then we reworked it in the first person, right. but, but it is nonfiction. It's, it it's is, a yeah. And in some ways, First Cut and Aftershock, the novels, are a continuation of that voice. Even the narrative though, voice is much the same. Yeah. yeah so because it's our voice. <laughs> but of course, it's it's a fictionalization yeah. of cases that we, we take we take a case that, that Judy has actually worked, worked on, on and then go from there into the world of American noir detective stories. Yeah. 
uh, and, and craft a story out of it. And, and part of the reason for that is because every time I come home and tell TJ about one of my cases, he always gets frustrated. He goes, well, what happened next? Did they catch him? Um, do you, who did it? I'm like, I don't know. I just did the autopsy. I handed it off to the <laughs> DA and went on to the next autopsy. Yeah, I like, I've got new cases. So do they. I don't go <laughs> skulking around asking what happened to the old one. So, so this is our opportunity to finish those stories using our imagination yes. or um, mixing multiple cases together. Oh, I absolutely love this. I think this is so cool that you have a writing partner in your life partner, um, that, that you're basing it on true stories, which thanks to Judy's work and the more you have firsthand knowledge of, I mean, this is just so cool and so fascinating. I've never hosted anyone. I've hosted five writing partnerships, some of which were, some of whom were married, some of whom were friends, some of whom were just collaborators, um, one other married couple, but no one's ever worked in a morgue. So this is so, so cool. Um, I want to welcome, Godfrey, welcome Liz. Gail would like to know, um, how can you discuss living in New Zealand and how that influences your writing? Great question, Gail. Gail, top community member. Thank you. We came to New Zealand because I was working at the Alameda County Sheriff Corners office in the Bay Area and COVID-19 had uh, already emerged in community in the United States. And so I put together protocols for what I thought we needed to do in order to keep us safe and then they weren't being followed. Um, some of them were implemented, some were not, some were implemented and not enforced. Mm -hmm. And I started to get nervous. I started to get scared that I would get exposed, that I would bring it home to TJ, to my mom, who's 75 years old. Um, and I got an email basically from New Zealand, uh, a company called Communio that said, how would you like to work in a place without worries of COVID-19? And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I returned <laughs> my... TV immediately told TJ and our daughters. Uh, New um, Zealand New Zealand has yeah. a chronic shortage of quite a number of different uh, subspecialties of medicine. medicine. And forensic pathology is always one. They, they often are bringing in doctors from the United States, Canada, Britain to work for a few months or a year yeah. um, as, as sort of a working vacation. And in this case, we've come we hope for longer under right. the same sort of circumstances on an essential worker visa yeah. because Judy works a job that nobody in this country can fill right now. So that, that's the message to some degree to the audience with regards to forensic pathology is if you have an interest in forensic pathology, this is a wonderful career opportunity. And when it, when it comes There's to plenty writing, jobs. when it comes to writing in um, New Zealand, yeah. we we were lucky enough that yeah, any, we're any in of you who are isolation for two weeks, right? So when you, when you fly in, you're in managed isolation in a hotel for for two weeks uh, to make sure that you don't have COVID, and that that was a fascinating process. Uh, but during it, uh, we got the copy edits for First Cut. And any of you who no, are writers, I mean, for Aftershock, for Aftershock, for Aftershock the, second the second book. So <laughs> any of you who are writers know that when you get the copy edits, you just have to buckle down and just concentrate and do nothing else. I was locked in a hotel room for two weeks with <laughs> nothing else anyway. to do, to do the copy edits and shoot this over at Judy and go back. So yeah. that was great. It was a great way to finish the book. But the books are set in our home city of San Francisco. Yeah. And someday we will, I think, set a book in New Zealand, yeah, but not in the immediate future. Yeah, we'd like to, we'd like we're, we're working on how to integrate the experience that I went through with COVID into the Jesse Tesca series, but uh, make it her, uniquely hers. Wow, this is this is just so cool, and I didn't know that about about um, New Zealand having a a, a a need for careers such as this. Oh well, um, yeah. <laughs> so Judy, what is it like to be do we, to do autopsies every day. I mean, what a fascinating and very unique career. Did you know you always wanted to do that? Did you fall into it, you know, accidentally? Well, that's chapter one of Working Stiff right there. <laughs> that's right. So, so that's what Working Stiff is about. It's about why I ended up in this field. Um, I went to medical school wanting to be a doctor because my dad was a doctor and I looked up to him and I wanted to be like him, but I didn't know what subspecialty I wanted to be. And in medical school, you do rotations. And uh, in my rotation in surgery, I decided I love surgery. I want to be a surgeon, but in working stiff uh, in chapter one or two, mm -hmm. two. Chapter we, one, yeah. by the way, the, the title of chapter one in working stiff is this can only end badly right. because that's what I would tell people whenever they ask Dr. Melnick to tell them a story, yeah, I, I will interrupt and say, remember if the story starts with a guy goes up the ladder with a can of beer and a power tool, this can only end badly. <laughs> Right. So I, I, but, but my personal story ended up well, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. but it started out badly because, <laughs> yeah. um, surgery, surgery, surgery internship, uh, in 1996 in Boston, 
was a very, very rough experience. And, and, and I, TJ I was you with decided me. you didn't, that yeah. wasn't the life you wanted. That wasn't. And TJ was with me through the whole process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he's been, we've been together since. But also, you know, what, what I remember is that you looked back in, on medical school and said, you know, I really loved pathology. I did. I did. And so when I decided that surgery was not for me, I switched to pathology and I did the different rotations in pathology residency. And when I did my rotation at the New York City Medical Examiner's Office, and I went out to my first scene, which was a crane that had collapsed in the middle of uh, Midtown Manhattan. Um, I realized, oh, this is where I need to be. <laughs> this is so exciting. I finally know, you know, you, you just find your, you know, you get to go under the police tape, you get to interview people, then you get to go to the morgue and see what really happened. It was so exciting. And that's actually the open, if, if anybody. Yeah, the opening scene of Aftershock yeah. has has some echoes right. of, of that first experience that Judy had um, with a, right. a death in public view. Yeah, and, and the opening role. and the opening uh, uh, chapter of Working Stiff is about that scene, about going to that crime scene and how I discovered I wanted to be a forensic pathologist. Oh, that's so cool. Margaret is saying chapter title, this can only add, end badly is brilliant, LOL. She loves it as do I. Oh, this is so fantastic. Um, by the way, Kirkus called Working Stiff a transfixing account of death from the mundane to the oddly hair raising, a rave review from Kirkus there. Um, so congratulations. It's a, it's a New York Times bestseller, yeah, by the way. Also. Yes, yes, absolutely. TJ and Judy are the New York Times bestselling authors of now three books. Um, a bustle naming your uh, first cut a most anticipated book of January 2020. You already have another one out. Scalpel Sharp raves Kathy Reichs. Um, this is absolutely fantastic. So tell us, um, what, how do, what do you think the most important um, element of keeping those pages turning, of writing something that is transfixing, hair raising, keeping the suspense going? You want to well, what, one thing, one thing <laughs> that we we try to specialize in here at Working Stiff Industries is <laughs> uh, verisimilitude. We yes. the, the one of the reasons we started writing detective fiction is we wanted to get the science right. We wanted to get the, what what Judy and her colleagues do, and her colleagues, not just the doctors, but everybody who works in a medical examiner or coroner's office, get what they do right. Mm -hmm. So we start from there. the The science is always, always real. She does not let me get away with anything. There's lots of places where I want to cut corners and well, can't we do this? That no, she won't let me do that. Yeah. <laughs> but in terms of making it making something a page turner, you know, there's certain. Uh, you know, arts or, you know, the, there's part of the writing craft that's associated with that. But ultimately, anytime we're stuck, though, TJ usually comes, TJ is the one who gets stuck because he's doing most of the heavy lifting. And then he comes to me and he says, okay, I'm stuck. This is where we're at in the book. What happens this next? Is, and this is where we need to <laughs> right, get to. Right. What, how do we get there? How do we get there? And then I think about, well, what would I do if I were at work? And mm -hmm. this is where I am in my investigation. Mm -hmm. Well, I would consult with this person or I would call up that person. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it'll be like, I'll sit at the microscope and look at something. And teacher's like, that's really boring. Um, right, I get on the phone and call this person. Yeah, let's have you go and go actually meet, meet them. them. Right. I'm like, okay, I can do that. Yeah. I can do that. So we do, we certainly do take <laughs> liberty, a take little, a little poetic liberty. liberty and and we, we do stretch what, what uh, the ways that Judy might do her job. And Jesse yeah. Tesca is a character very unlike Judy also. And, and well, Tesca like especially, she's a real <laughs> risk taker though, which is how we yeah. get her into trouble and yeah. have her uh, get out from behind her microscope. Yeah, I'm not a risk taker, but I do get out from behind my microscope. That yeah. is one thing that it's, I mean, we should say that everything that Jesse does is something that a forensic pathologist would and could do. Yes, um, true. A lot of people don't realize that we actually work as detectives and investigate our cases. Um, you know, the police are really only interested in cases that are slam dunk homicides. If it's clearly a homicide, then they run with it. But the cases that aren't clear, the ones that are either, is it a suicide or an accident? Is it an accident or a homicide? Um, when it's on the fence like that, where it's not really clear, the police don't often investigate it. They've got actual real homicides to investigate. So they're not going to do all that legwork. And we're the ones who call up the families and get the information or sometimes go to the scene and figure it out. And as soon as it's a homicide, we hand it off to them. But that's why you'll the series and most of the books focus on the ones that are not that clear, at least initially. Wow, I actually didn't know that, that I did not know that that, that 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 you did that investigative work. That's fascinating. Um, and I want to get back to that. I just want to hop over to a question from our audience. Gail asking, showing my age, did you ever see the Quincy TV show and did you <laughs> like it? 
I, I do. Did you watch Grinch? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. See, I watched There were only it. three channels where I grew up. Of course I watched it. <laughs> I watched, yes, we're, we're in our 50s. <laughs> so yes, we watched Quincy. I watched it briefly and found it really annoying. I didn't find him to be a compelling character. Um, specifically, what I found annoying about him is that he's so mean and nasty. He's not nice to the people around him. And most forensic pathologists, in order to be successful in their jobs, they have to be people persons. They have to be able to interact with the police, with the district attorneys. They have to be um, capable of explaining science in simple ways that a jury can understand. So mm. I didn't find him compelling as a character. My, my favorite TV show growing up, also showing my age, was MASH about surgeons <laughs> because of the humor. Um, and Judy's yeah. told me that the one show that, that, that we've, yeah. she's watched and that we've watched together that really gets what she does and what medical examiners do exactly right is The Wire. The David Wire's Simon's yeah. uh, miniseries, The Wire, okay. has some, some uh, segments with, with interactions with the medical examiner and it's absolutely spot on. Yeah, because it separates the roles, you know, that you don't have the medical examiner running around with guns. Which knowing his work it isn't a surprise, <laughs> yeah. right? I actually recently learned though through my own research for my next book that within a certain medical examiner's offices, you can do a, and some are called coroners and some are called medical examiners and there seems to be no rhyme or reason as to why that is city per city decision, but they can actually do a, a trial. They can have their own investigation and trial. Okay. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So that's called an inquest. And to answer your question about the difference between medical examiners and coroners, I can answer that quickly because okay. I answer it on the stand really frequently. Judy, Judy, <laughs> works, Judy works as a, ends up yeah. working as a forensic patho. I mean, as, as an expert witness in court quite a lot. So yeah. she gets these questions all the time. Right. Judy, so you're uh, the coolest. Well, that's part of the job, that's though. Part, I mean, that's part, yeah. of, part of her city job. You know, if there's like if there's a murder and eventually it goes to trial and they want to know what the forensics are. Up she goes. So a coroner system is one in which either law enforcement or a non-physician um, is appointed or elected to the position. Sometimes the position is a physician, but they don't have to be a forensic pathologist. It's like they could be an ophthalmologist, they can be an OBGYN, but they're often appointed or elected to the position. Mm -hmm. And in many places, especially rural places, they're law enforcement officers. They're part of the sheriff's department, for instance. Medical examiner systems are, this, they do the same death investigations. They determine cause of death, they do autopsies, but the whole operation is run by a forensic pathologist. By That's, a doctor. By, not just a doctor, but someone who is specially trained to investigate deaths in this level of subspecialty. So it's a subspecialty. First, you have to do pathology, where you study for four years or minimum three, uh, how to do autopsies and how to look at tumors under the microscope, for instance. And okay. then you do an extra year of training called a fellowship, which is what Working Stiff is about. So Working Stiff is about my forensic fellowship. And that extra year allows you to be become a forensic pathologist and there are examinations and things like that. So the medical examiner system, it's all run by doctors. The coroner system, it's run by administrators or law enforcement officers. But ultimately, the goal is the same. Figure out the cause and the manner of death. And so that's the difference between the system. And what was the original question? Remind um, about they that I learned that they can actually have a, a, tr a trial almost. Right. So the inquest system is left over from the coroner system, where the which is hundreds of right. years old and goes back to oldie England. Right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And so in England, the crown, the term coroner comes from crowner. It's a derivative of crowner, and the crown wanted to know why people died because if someone died uh, by their own hand, a suicide, for instance, then it was a crime against the crown because the crown was also the church. And so all their property would go to the church, go to the crown. And if they were killed, for instance, by their heirs, you know, well, uh, if they're killed, you, you want to know who done it, who done it. Yeah. Because if, if it's, if it's the rich guy's son yes, and he killed him to inherit all the lands, then the crown is going to take those. The crown takes the land. So that's why the crown has an interest in this, not only in from terms of a law enforcement strategy, but also a, a state, tax collection, a state, a state, in the state tax, yeah. basically. And, but if yeah. the rich guy fell off his horse and died right. in an accident, yeah. then, then you get to inherit. And this, this is what the manners of death are. Right. So manners of death are ways of classifying the, the same types of death as what are the manners? So we have a natural accident, homicide, suicide, and undetermined when we can't figure out which, how it classifies. But the inquest process 
is done by the crown or by the coroner in order to have people come and testify to what happened. And it's a way of showing transparency and airing out grievances, so to speak, especially in cases that may not go to a criminal inquiry. So for example, recently, if you look in the newspaper, there was an inquest in Los Angeles County about a man who died in police custody. And the DA may or may not press charges against the officer, but the inquest process allows for a legal proceeding where everything can come to light, where people can testify and um, the, uh, the hearing officer, in that case it was a judge, can determine the cause and the manner of death. They're relatively rare in the United States yeah. nowadays. Wow, this is, this is fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, Margaret saying books set in San Francisco, surgery in Boston, crane accident in Midtown, New York, living in New Zealand. You're quite the world travelers. Do you see the series traveling? Good question, Ooh. Margaret. Thank you. Oh, oh, by, and by, by the way, also, <laughs> yeah. we should point out that, uh, that, that Judy is an immigrant to the United States. She was born in born Israel, Israel and came to the U.S. when she was five years old. And so. Jesse Teska has got a Polish immigrant root. So, right. yeah, we, I mean, I think that that's a really good point is we, we were travelers before we had kids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we yeah, I come from, I come from um, right outside Lynn, Massachusetts, where, where Jesse comes from. Also. Right. So. And, and then when I was in medical school, the two of us went backpacking through Europe together. Um, we've taken our kids, you know, to multiple different locations. We certainly do want to want to travel <laughs> with like Jesse. Travel with um, Jesse. If, if, if we're fortunate enough to, to continue writing these books, we are going to bring her to other places. Yeah. But yeah. for now, I mean, we love San Francisco. San Francisco is our adopted home. Neither of us is from yeah, there. We love and we lived there for like 18 years before we moved here to New Zealand. We love the city and we love writing about the city and we hope to go back to the city. It took a lot to drag us away from that place. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and yeah. and and we want to go back, but we will also uh, yeah expand expand the uh, the the milieu of where where Jesse's going. Right, and the best part about Jesse as a character is she's currently working at the San Francisco ME's office just like I did, but I worked in the San Francisco Medical Examiner's office for nine years. Then I went to Alameda County. I worked there for seven years, and now I'm working in New Zealand. So, uh, and in addition to that, I do. Uh, legal consulting work. So when I get consulted on a case, I travel all over the world. Uh, I've, you know, been to the Midwest, I've been to Florida, I've been, you know, all over the United States, I've been consulted on cases internationally as well in Israel and in other countries. So you have the opportunity to be an international level detective as a forensic pathologist being brought in as a consultant. And I'm hoping we can bring Jesse in that direction. We'll see. We haven't quite gotten to those books yet, but that's what's in, that's what we're thinking about. Oh, this is so cool. I love it. The chance to be an interna international detective. This is fabulous. Uh, Gail is asking, what is life like in New Zealand in the age of COVID? It sounds like you made a good move, Gail. I agree. <laughs> I hate to tell you, because yeah. you'll be jealous, it's completely normal. It's normal. Oh. It really is. The things that we do to make sure that the next outbreak of COVID here, because it will, there will be another outbreak, the next outbreak is controllable, is there is a scanner, uh, an app that that most people have on their, on their smartphones. Every single public space you go up, up to has a barcode outside you scan that to the app and it records that you were there so that if there's an outbreak and they they tr trace it to that spot then they send you a notification saying you may have been exposed contact these people will tell you what what you are advised to do that's number one number two we will still wash our hands a lot number three we wear masks on public transportation and then the airplanes and so the right airplanes. now on yeah, airplanes, airplanes masks are required but not outside in the community the the Part of the reason for moving here um, was because I had been studying protocols for COVID-19 as part of my job for the Alameda County office. In fact, I was collecting protocols from all over the world. I got them from Singapore. I got them from China. I got what all whatever I could get. And when I saw the New Zealand response, I knew that I needed to be there, um, not only to protect my family, but also to learn from the process. And I think that the United States has a lot to learn from New Zealand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, you know, people kind of poo poo the New Zealand responses saying, oh, it was relatively easy because it's an island. It is easier when you are an island, but it, but New Zealand was by no means disconnected from the world. In fact, uh, there's a lot of trade that goes back and forth. From Tourism Asia. Is, is a big part of the economy here that's been shut down. It is. And, and so, the immediate uh, lesson that we can teach is that, that New Zealand can teach the United States is that this is containable and it is actually 
eliminatable. You can eliminate it. Eliminate is that a word? Um, <laughs> I always turn to my English major. <laughs> is that a word? Um, it, it, you can eliminate COVID and we have to pursue an elimination strategy because containment doesn't work with this virus. It's and going to come back up. Kiwis were very worried after their, 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 yeah. their lockdown lasted like six weeks and it was really, really, it was enforced. like really enforced. And um, they, that made an impression on them. And yeah. also it, it took the, the economy took a big hit because the government paid everybody to stay home essentially yeah. and everyone was worried that that was going to lead to a recession well the new zealand economy is actually doing really really Rebounded well huge. it's astounded everybody yeah uh, and i mean i think that it shows that if you have a healthy population you have a healthy economy and that's what's happening here yeah and paid to stay home is what made the difference it's not enough to just give somebody a two thousand dollar stimulus check for several months they were actually paid their salaries through their companies and many people many of our friends said here, here in New Zealand said, it was fun. <laughs> you know, like we liked it. We liked it. It was a staycation. But um, people, people didn't have to choose between, worry. between paying the rent and getting sick. Yeah. Right. And right. that made, that made a huge difference here. People, people, uh, they watch the, what's going on in they the world outside it. and they can see that and they're on pins and needles mm -hmm. about what's going on outside of New Zealand. And, and they hope that, uh, vaccination starts spreading very soon. Right. Yeah, exactly. I think this does. I think this shows exactly as you said that this is containable. This is eliminatable, and also this is the power of having a female president who actually listens. Yeah, to yeah. yeah. we're very, we're very aware of that too. Gail is saying this is fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, also, that you guys married well. I agree. You seem like such a great pair. Well, I did. <laughs> Yeah, TJ, you did well. Uh, I'm I'm broadcasting live. I'm the luckiest. I'm the luckiest sort of writer. I am a dilettante writer. I don't have to work to, to make rent. I don't have to write anything I don't want to. Yeah. Dr. Melanick makes a very good living. Thank you very much. Yeah, you I'm to... also lucky because I, I, don't have to do, I don't have to do most of the writing. I just throw ideas at him, and then at one point he just says, "Okay, enough talking. Let me go write." <laughs> <That's> <laughs> oh my god, I love you guys. Liz would like to know what do you think of the new TV show Coroner. God, have haven't we, watched haven't, it. We haven't seen it. We don't. We can't. We, we don't can't watch, get American television. Here, not only anyway. that, but we don't. We don't watch. We don't watch fictional TV shows <laughs> about medical examiners because Judy starts shouting at the screen immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the problem. We can't do it. I can't watch. Some of them, them. are good, but um, we do. It's just any plot yeah. hole. She goes bananas. So we don't. That, do it. That's the thing is, I can't watch them because they're not forensically accurate. So I end up just yelling at the television. It's very stressful. And then on top of it, like, what do you want? You know, if you've been doing something all day, do you want to then watch TV right. about what you just did all? day i mean even if it's accurate it's too stressful i want to watch something to decompress that so we're not familiar with it. sorry <laughs> that makes sense that makes sense patricia will, says she is available to carry your luggage if you need help traveling just saying <laughs> patricia yeah. speaking for all of us top community member there patricia thank you sharon yeah. welcome gail says contract tracing yes um uh, Margaret saying, wow, next level preemptive contact tracing. Yeah, they're doing that in Australia too. My friends are telling me there. It's so much, it's so much better. Patricia saying, this is brilliant and makes so much common sense. Manhattan is an island and it became an epi, epi center. Um, exactly. Patricia, thank you. Yes. I, I will, I will point out that Britain is an island. Yeah. Britain's also an island. Ireland. Uh, <laughs> Australia is also an island and they've got it under control. Um, Gail saying another job when you return science advisor to TV shows. Gail, yes, that is actually that is actually a career. And one of our other guests, Alice Henderson, who's a wildlife researcher um, protecting endangered species, has worked for both the Lucasfilm Foundation, um, for Star Wars, for Star Trek, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer to make sure they get the science right. So you need done that too. I, for I've done that already. Uh, I did that when <laughs> I was in residency for ER. Remember back in the day, yeah, back in the day. And then um, I, I've done it. I was on an episode of the Myth Mythbusters. Oh my God, there's a great Mythbusters. You totally check if it out. If you're Mythbusters fans, yeah, it's go streaming. find the episode. Bite, Bite the, the bullet. bullet. Yeah. And uh, the B-roll on that on that that one is Dr. Melanick yeah. investigating something. Don't give it I away. I won't say any more than that. It also, and actually, the yeah. A-roll is really fascinating too because the A-roll is about how the best way to to seat people in an airplane. It's yeah. really it's, it's a really great. good episode. Yeah. So Bite the bullet. I highly Netflix. recommend that one. Mm -hmm. okay, and then we're all, we're all we're gonna gonna actually, I'm currently in uh, top secret discussions uh, with a, a film uh, production company about uh, potentially pitching a film. Uh, based on my consulting practice. So the consult cases that I do, um, how 
consulting and forensic pathologists can give a second look or a uh, different perspective, sometimes doing experiments uh, to figure out uh, what actually happened in cases. So but that, I can't, can't talk about the details. Ooh, we're all excited. Come back and tell us when that happens. Um, uh, Margaret would like to know, what do you watch to decompress? Any good New Zealand shows? Now we need to know, Judy. Ooh. Um, so for New Zealand shows. There, there's a show <laughs> called, um, yeah. oh, wait, it's, it's the, the, Wellington Paranormal. Wellington Paranormal is awesome. Is a comedy show <laughs> uh, in the vein of Reno 911, yeah. where it's Wellington cops investigating uh, super natural activity in the city where we currently where we live, live, which is New Zealand's capital city of Wellington, a city that reminds us a lot of San Francisco, it actually. Looks like it's, it a lot. It's yeah. smallish and manageable. It's hilly. It's windy. There's lots of hipsters. We love it. <laughs> and so we watch, uh, so yeah, we watch fun. that. Uh, and then so for American shows, I mean, I'm a big fan of The Daily Show. Um, yeah. In fact, yeah. I was actually also a consultant on The Daily Show. That's right. Yes. Yeah. For there, was there, so another thing you can stream and look up, there was Wait, a- was it The Daily Show or was it- No, The Daily no, Show. Uh, the Last Week Tonight. Last Week Tonight. Sorry. Yeah, but oh, John Oliver. Oliver. I love him. Last Week Tonight. I was going to love The Daily Show. Love Last Week Tonight. And Last Week Tonight, I was a consultant on. They had an episode about forensic pathology. So That's worth looking up, too. Yeah, that's Really Fantastic. good last week tonight yeah. about forensic pathology and about death investigation. Yeah, I'm not I'm not interviewed, but I'm credited. At the but end. when it comes to um, to televised entertainment, we tend to follow whatever our two teenage daughters yes. <laughs> tell us we're watching, and they have yeah, great they taste. Have and taste. actually, right now, Leah, who is 17, is hooked on The Simpsons. So we've go gone back, and we're on season five of The Simpsons. <laughs> you know, when Conan O'Brien was was the producer, right. and there, it's just so great. I haven't watched it in 30 years, and to watch it with uh, with a teenager with fresh eyes is a lot of fun. So we have to explain some of the jokes. We do a lot. Of, yeah, a lot of stuff is a little dated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Um, Patricia is saying this is very exciting news about your secret, your secret uh, dealings with it. With we want to know more. Uh, Gail saying, TJ, you are right. You did marry well. <laughs> I think we all have a crush on Judy. Um, this is fantastic. So we 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 have just about one more minute here. I just want to say, getting back to aftershock, what is it you want people to walk away having read book two, which by the way, everybody can be a standalone book. Or, but it's also book two in the Jesse Tuska series. What do you want people to feel, to experience, to walk away from Aftershock having felt? I, I want them to get into my shoes because um, even though Aftershock, you can tell from the title, we're not spoiling anything, um, occurs during an earthquake. Um, the similarities in terms of how a uh, mass fatality response occurs and how you have to continue doing your investigative work on your regular cases, um, even while you're juggling this fatality incident um, is, is as true as it can be. It's based on my own experiences, both um, in New York during 9-11. And then also I was at the Alameda County Sheriff Coroner's office during um, a mass fatality incident called the Ghost Ship Fire, which was a fire in a warehouse. So I, I think that the take home is about juggling those two roles of being a detective on an actual a homicide case where you have to investigate and figure out what happened on a regular case that happens simultaneously having to deal with the stresses of uh, a disaster that befalls your city and affects everybody. And my answer is very simple. My ethic as a writer is it's a great privilege for me to be allowed into your head to take over your brain. And <laughs> I, I expect that at the end of it, you feel like the eight to 12 hours that you've given us uh, you find entertaining enough to be worth your time and money yeah. before having having let us in there. That's that's yeah. basically it. Oh, and, and I love that you'll follow us. That you'll follow. That you like the character. Yeah, we like also Jesse. hope that you'll get hooked on, yeah, on Jessica's because it's hard not to be. <laughs> Ah, oh, I love both of these answers, both of these perspectives. You're right, TJ. Oh, oh I'm sorry. One other thing. Yeah. Yeah. You you were right to say that. Yeah, Aftershock is a standalone. So if you read Aftershock and you enjoy it, please go back and read, read First, First Cut because you'll enjoy First Cut a lot after reading yeah. Aftershock. Yeah. One won't spoil the other either. Oh, cool. Thank you so much. Oh, we have just two more questions. Someone was <laughs> who uh, Margaret would like to know who sleeps on the top bunk there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're in a tree house right now. <laughs> this is a, it's a youth it's a hostel, hostel in in the north of of New Zealand where we're actually on holiday right now. 
yeah, with they, our daughters. As they say on vacation. Um, so actually, our, yeah, our daughters. The bottom are bunk in the... is a double. So we were actually <laughs> sleeping on the bottom. The daughters are next. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, Liz would like, would like you to know, she said she just reserved Working Stiff on Hoopla. She can't wait to listen. You're now in her to be read TBR pile. Thank you. Yes. Right. Thank yeah. you so much. Big fan of Hoopla. I like Hoopla a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And the audio uh, book for Working Stiff actually won a headphones award. Tanya yes, Eby mm -hmm. is, is, is very, very good actor. Yeah. And the, the audio, the audio books for, for both First Cut and Aftershock are by too. Amanda Nolan. Dolan. Uh, Dolan, Dolan. I'm Dolan. sorry. Dolan are really, really great too. Yeah. She does all the accents, which is amazing. We're really impressed with Yeah. That. San Francisco, of course, there's, there's, <laughs> it, there's, there's a, the, the cast of characters comes from all over the world and she's able to reproduce that. It's really amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's the, we didn't realize what a challenge it is for an audio actor, but it is. No, I noticed that in their resumes, they say they list all the accents they can do. <laughs> so this is fantastic. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much, TJ. Thank you so much, Judy. I want to remind everyone that you can buy Aftershock today through our very special partnership with bookshop.org, which supports independent bookstores. As you know, or may know, one independent bookshop per week has gone out of business since the pandemic began last March, which is just devastating to think about. So we have to support indies if we want to come out of this and have bookshops to browse and aisles to linger in and pages to smell and a cup of coffee to get while we do it. So you you can buy the book on sale today through bookshop.org. Margaret's putting the link in the comments and you can get this great scientifically accurate look inside what it's like to be a forensic pathologist in a medical examiner's. We can walk in Dr. Judy's shoes, have a great <laughs> mystery and support indies. It's a win, 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 win. So Amen. thank you, mystery and thriller fans. Thank you, TJ and Judy, for joining us from your treehouse vacation in northern New Zealand. Gail saying this was absolutely wonderful. Thank you for the virtual visit to New Zealand. Gail, thanks as always for joining us. Thank you to both of our featured authors. You have been a delight. And we will see you next time right here on Mighty Mysteries. Have a great day, everyone. Gail, see you soon. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks.